local business. Uh, this is based on my latest book. Uh, I have good news. Next year, the second edition of this book is coming up. This became a very best-selling book. And uh, I, I, for this second edition, I will try to get some much more augmented uh, cases and examples and much more framework to support my views. Uh, well, the objective of this talk are quite simple is to highlight the importance of lab. Um, this is a book published by Ruth Leach. This is an academic publish, one of the big four. And when I proposed these ideas to Ruth Leach, they were very welcoming because the word lab is not used in the business environment. And it's more used to, for example, refer to friends, family, but there is research on lab in business activities. And here we will see that the connotation, the meaning of lab that we are using in this talk is not the one that we use for friend, family, or a partner what we call sentimental aspect of lab, but it's a much more humanistic aspect of lab, which can be applied to business activities and non-business one. There is some research on this. We will re refer this later to this research. And also how this lab, this humanistic lab, which include, for example, compassion, empathy, support, care, generosity, gratitude, affect business activities. We will provide with example that adopt a loving attitude toward different stakeholders, stakeholders that we will define as individuals, and groups with interest in an organization. So there are two, uh, there is a quote, interesting quote from two researchers, a biologist that uh, observed, there is something peculiar about human beings. We are loving animals. I know that we kill each other and we do all these horrible things, but if you look at any story of corporate transformation where everything begins to go well, innovation appears and people are happy to be there, you will see that there is a story of love. Now, what is love from the perspective of this uh, book, this research uh, study? Uh, well, love relates from the broader perspective. This was analyzed by humanist psychologists and social psychologists. Love refers to qualities uh, such as connection, closeness, affinity, sympathy, care, support, gratitude, generosity, compassion, and others. This means that are quality that nurture relationship with other people. In the business environment, these qualities nurture relationship with different stakeholders, such as customers, employees, suppliers, community members. And a loving attitude uh, from this perspective is the foundation of fruitful relationship in any business activities and non-business ones. So, but this specific connotation of love that we are using here, that is different, from the one that people generally use when they said, I love you to a friend or a family, uh, is volitional. This means that depends on will. It's not so much emotional as the sentimental aspect of love, but it's volitional. This means that people are willing to uh, adopt a loving attitude and to support others uh, through these qualities, connection, closeness, sympathy. They, they try to be compassionate. They try to be generous and thankful. So this means that uh, there is a decision to support others, to be caring with others, to be kind, kind with others. And this is what we call the basic or limited view of love. This means that we use for family, friends, and partners. This means it's much more emotional, sentimental, but then we have a much broader connotation of love we call humanistic that include all this quality that we have already mentioned. And they're quite important for business relationships. So how this working in practice in the business environment? And what is the research uh, saying about this? What is research saying about this? Well, first of all, uh, we have to understand that in the business environment, there are <clears throat> some terms or words or concept, we call concept uh, that are uh, coming from military disciplines. For example, strategy, tactics, this type of terms that people utilize on a frequent basis that are well used for, for example, developing plans, strategies, are generally opposite to this connotation of love, the humanistic connotation of love. Why? Because it implies beating others, outpacing others, uh, getting market share from others. So this means that in this practice, uh, many of the business terms that are well used and used for a purpose might be against all this connotation of love. But also, uh, the majority of these terms are quantitative by nature. In business, we use a lot of terms that are quantitative. For example, you might have heard of the SMART objectives, specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and related. 
for example, an objective that could be about profitability, a quantitative term, or a productivity, another quantitative term, or a term related to market share. These parameters are quantitative. This means they can be measured. However, if we see the qualities, sympathy, uh, affection, compassion, they are qualitative. They cannot be measured. How you can measure compassion? How you can measure sympathy? How you can measure care and generosity? So they are qualitative. So many entrepreneurs said that uh, when I give this talk also to entrepreneurs, they tell me that love doesn't have anything to do with business activities because they are there to make profits. This is the purpose of business. You already know this. And they try to offer good product and services that are interesting for customers and get profit over time. All these ideas of love, humanistic aspect of love, doesn't appear uh, among their objectives. Uh, and but we saw that love is a broad concept which implies wishing the best to others and also supporting and caring for them. Uh, these business leaders, the one that I generally am related to through my consultancy and training activities, tell me that uh, what is important are the key performance indicators, what we mentioned, profit, market share, sales, productivity. And we have to understand that this is a very limited view of, of business. I'm not saying that these indicators are not important. They are very important for the company's survival and success. However, we saw that uh, these qualities that are mentioned again there, connection, uh, closeness, and others, can nurture relationship with different stakeholders. And these indicators are always, the nat this indicator, profitability, productivity, efficiency, are always the natural result of good relationship with stakeholders. Why? Because companies cannot achieve these key indicators, profitability, productivity, without customers, without employees, without a community member, without supplier. So the company needs these stakeholders to achieve this indicator. So a good approach will be to nurture this relationship with the stakeholders by being compassionate, by being kind, by being supportive, by being generous, by being grateful. Uh, and by doing so, these key performance indicators tend to be achieved naturally because they are always the natural result of good relationship with stakeholders. Uh, now, a very important aspect of a loving attitude is affection, caring for others and avoiding a negative behavior toward others, for example, slandering, gossiping. In many workplaces, I see many companies that there is very common. A colleague slandering each other or gossiping or criticizing or guilt tripping. This generates a negative work environment that according to research, bring about lower productivity and lower uh, morale in the workplace. Uh, a loving person make others feel at peace. There is a concept in uh, social psychology and psychology that is called psychological safety. When people treat each other in a loving way, the others can feel at ease. They can express their ideas freely. They can disclose their views uh, without fear of being punished or penalized. And they can be themselves. Instead, in a work environment that is unloving, there is a lot of fear. This means that people are fearful of making mistakes. They feel restless. They feel stress. And stress, you know, that brings about a lot of negative consequences. Lower productivity, lower innovation, and higher absenteeism and others. Uh, Bounce Mister, that is a very famous researcher, and other researchers observe that positive behavior and attitudes toward others are important, but also decreasing negative behavior. For example, frowning on others, insulting, not supporting them, not acknowledging their contribution. And there is a, a God, Godman also observed that uh, there should be a positive interaction that outnumbers the, the positive behavior, outnumbers the negative behaviors. Uh, Daniel Goleman observed that also the concept of uh, empathy, support, compassion are important to what they call emotional intelligence. When you are emotionally intelligent, you're not only recognizing your own emotions and expressing them, the, this emotion in a clear and direct way, but also you are taking care of others. You are taking care of relationships. You are also aware of their feelings and try to support them. 
Uh, there is a paper also from Varsadian O'Neill that is not mentioned there that observed that in a workplace that is there is a lot of support, love. They use the word love in, love in, the, in that paper, uh, and also camaraderie, kindness. Uh, we will call a loving workplace. People tend to be more satisfied. Employees are more satisfied. Customers are more satisfied. Why? Because when employees are more satisfied, they can serve customers in a better way. But also, there is lower absenteeism. I Means people like to go to work. They enjoy working at, for this company. And also, we see also that there is higher productivity in loving workplaces, and also lower stress levels. And uh, this impact positively on what? On the bottom line, bottom line profit. This means that these companies with a loving workplace, they tend to have higher profitability, higher sales, higher market share. Why? Because employees feel much more at ease, more supported, less stress. Customers feel more satisfied. They can be served better. And this is creating a positive cycle. The opposite happens in workplaces where there is a lot of fear. There is a lot of stress. People are less productive. This is a bit common sense. When I give this talk, I always tell my attendees, hopefully in 10 years time, all companies are acting in a loving way and won't be giving this talk. And the world will be the ideal world that we're looking for. But because we see so many companies that are acting in an unloving way, companies that are infusing fear into the workplace, penalizing employees, being disconsiderate uh, and being uh, uh, neglectful with employees and other stakeholders. So we have to highlight the importance of all this. So what are the traits of a loving company? Well, a trait, these are very brief uh, summary of the traits, but we can say that the companies that are loving, and then we will give some example, companies that are loving try to satisfy customers, but not only satisfy, because any company can satisfy customers. They try to exceed customer need. And this means that they try to give more than the customer expected. For example, if I go to a coffee shop and I ask for a cappuccino, a company that is acting in a loving way, might give me some biscuit free. Why? Because they know that my, I might like to drink the cappuccino with this nice uh, added product. So, uh, but also this company try to avoid deceiving customers or manipulating them. We might have all had in the past negative experiences as customer. Company that lied to us, company that deceive us, company that they promise and didn't deliver. And in my book, I mentioned a very important tenet that is company should always under promise and over deliver. This means that company should be humble with their promising. Uh, this means offering things that are likely to deliver and also then surprising customer when they are delivering the product or service. This means exceeding customer expectation, giving them more than expected. Uh, most companies act in an opposite way. They overpromise, they promise what they cannot deliver, and then they underdeliver. The company also doesn't consider other organizations as enemies to defeat. You can say, but what about competitors? Are not there competitors in the marketplace? I agree with the concept of competitor, but if you focus too much on the concept of competitors and you consider only these companies as, as enemies, this means that there is a very close minded approach on business you cannot see these companies as potential partners to develop an alliance, for example, a strategic alliance or partnership. And there are many cases of company, for example, Nokia, Ericsson and others that develop partnership when they are before they were competitors or rival companies. And also these companies also consider other companies as example to emulate when these companies are very good or excellent at certain uh, product and services and also examples not to emulate when, for example, the companies are acting in an ethical way, when these companies, other companies are acting in an ethical way. The organization also that is loving does not de-skill employees with a monotonous, repetitive work. I, I, I visit companies every week and I see many companies that employees are completely demotivated. They do always the same thing and in a bureaucratic way, and they don't have any aspiration. They, they, they feel a bit hopeless and demotivated. Companies that are loving, they try to coach employees, mentor them. They try to support them, for example, with job rotation. This means allowing them to work in different areas. For example, if they're in the marketing department, they can go 
for example, one month to the other department, administrative department to have a much broader view of the company. And also they provide them with a lot of uh, training. This employee with a lot of training, for example, online training, offline training, workshops, seminars, uh, to enhance the employee's natural talents. And they try to provide with tasks that are aligned with their unique employee's talents. Uh, this company also doesn't have high profit as the sole objective, but they have social goals. This means impacted on the environment positively, for example, recycling, uh, using renewable sources of energy, and also they have social impact also on communities. Uh, this company doesn't treat employees as replaceable cogs, but they are they're treating them as human beings that have not only economic needs, for example, a good salary, but they have emotional needs, need to be recognized, need to be supported, and they have social needs, need to relate to other colleagues, for example, group working in groups and others. Uh, this company look for more natural ways to solve conflicts and communicate with the stakeholder. For example, if there is a conflict, the company with a, with a customer or a supplier, the company won't use a, an adversarial way of solving conflicts such as lawsuits. They won't look for a lawyer to sue the supplier. They will try look, to look for more friendly ways at first way to solve conflict, to preserve the relationship with these stakeholders. For example, they might use negotiation or they might use conciliation or mediation or arbitration that are friendly ways of solving conflicts. A company with a loving attitude also develop goodwill with different stakeholders and also try to um, consider the interests of everyone in a conflicting situation. For example, if the company want to set up a plant in a, in a new area, uh, they will take into account not only the interests of customers, and the company's interest, but also the interest of the community. Are we affecting the community in a positive way by setting up this new plant or factory? Can we consult with the community if they have any concern about our new endeavor? So it's important to take into account what we call win-win-win agreements. Everyone involved in this agreement directly or indirectly will be benefiting with this agreement. Not, there won't be what we call win-lose agreement where one uh, stakeholder is benefiting at the, at the expense of others. Example, and we're wrapping up, example of companies, uh, this is the short version of the presentation, but it's a very uh, substantial, you see a lot of um, substance uh, and example and theory, but well, let's go through the practice now. What are the example of companies with a loving attitude? Well, you have UPS. UPS, you know, the courier company, very famous and very successful, adopt a loving attitude toward the stakeholder, how? Reducing carbon dioxide emission. They are slowing down the planes to deliver the parcel worldwide. Why they do this? Because the idea is to deliver as soon as possible. But they do so to reduce carbon dioxide emission to be a positive with the environment, with positive impact to the environment. And they also, they help part-time employees obtain funds for the college educational courses. So they don't have to do this, but they try to support employees development. So they try to support them so that they can have access to better qualification and also more knowledge and they can be more skillful. Company like Google that everyone knows, surely the global developer of the search engine, eh, another product have a loving attitude. They use eh, an approach that is philanthropy. This means benefiting communities, for example, through volunteering, they provide grants to communities, they provide expert knowledge to community, free technological products to magnify their impact on the community. And also, this is a very important stakeholder community, but also in relation to the workplace, this company also tried to offer employees savory food free for these employees to enjoy. Very good example, will be nice that all companies do this. Uh, and this organization offers some series of services on site. Most of them are free, for example, hairdresser, doctor, physio therapies, legal advice, and others. So they try to look for the well-being. They don't like only employees to be productive. They want employees to be at ease, in a state of well-being, in a state of psychological safety, satisfied, happy. Uh, Southwest Airline also is a well-known company that is a low-cost airline. It's transparent to customers. This means that they inform customers exactly how much they will pay. They don't try to deceive customers. Most of the low-cost airlines, the one that I know, you start with a very low starting price, and then when you add the baggage, you end up paying three times or four times more. This company is deception. They try to 
convey the prices very straightforwardly and in a transparent way. Uh, well, we have another company, Honesty. Honesty, its imperational mission is to create and promote great tasting, healthy, organic beverages. This means that they have tea products, cold tea products, and organic means without preservative, without toxic uh, ingredients, without chemicals. This means that they're good for the health of customers and good for the environment, and to grow our business with the same honesty and integrity and being sustainable. This means caring for the environment, caring for community. And they also develop what they call a fair trade agreements. They have fair trade certification, which implies that they are uh, paying suppliers, they are compensated suppliers, the honesty suppliers uh, fairly. This means that they are not trying to take advantage of them. And also, as we saw, they use organic ing ingredients. Tom's, lastly, is another company well known that is a company that sells shoes uh, has been donating millions of shoes uh, to communities, especially to countries that have uh, needs and children cannot go to school. We're talking about third world countries where children cannot go to school because they don't have shoes. So this company is donating that in the past, I'm not sure they have already now uh, in place, but in the past they have a program that is two for one. Uh, so this means that for, um, one, uh, for every pair of shoes, they were donating uh, another pair of shoes for the community. The conclusion, the conclusion, Stephen Covey, the famous uh, thought leader observed that there is a state of interdependence will link all people. In the business environment, companies are linked to suppliers, community members, customers, and also employees and other stakeholders. So company cannot thrive with these stakeholders. So it's better to have this stakeholder on our side. How you can do this? By nurturing strong, robust, long-lasting relationship with stakeholders. And you do this, we, we gave a lot of examples, by supporting them, by being kind to them, by recognizing their needs and try to satisfy their needs properly, but also by understanding them, being generous and compassionate to them. Uh, this is aligned with a framework that is called the triple bottom line framework that is proposed uh, by Elkington and is about being profitable, what we call economic objective, being uh, having profits, but also being um, oriented to people, caring for employees, customers, suppliers that are human beings, but also caring for the planet, using renewable sources of energy, green processes and others. These are the references. And you want to know more about this. This is the book and this is my website. Thank you very much. I Thanks hope that you are, are you there? Yes, did yes. you hear? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruno. That was really interesting. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more that we could go into there, um, but I'd like to invite anybody um, who may have any questions should be able um, now to unmute yourself um, and ask any questions, or if you'd prefer, you can type those into the chat box. We do have a few more minutes uh, scheduled for, for any questions if you'd like. I can ask myself a question and nobody is asking any question. Probably it's a question that might be uh, on your mind. Uh, generally, when I deliver this type of talks, uh, attendees ask me, how can we implement? Uh, I'm, for example, I'm working for a company or mm -hmm. I'm uh, in this position. How can we implement? What is the next step? What we can do uh, yeah. on a practical level? And this is generally is an interesting question that generally come up that uh, is about simple steps because the book is about principle. It's not about strategy, it's not about tactics, but principles that anyone can apply and can produce ripple effects. A very simple way, a very uh, extensive part of the book, in one of the chapters is about generosity and gratitude. And let's dwell a bit on this. Uh, there is a lot of research on gratitude and um, 
generosity in the workplace and in the business environment. Companies uh, that are generous to stakeholders, to different stakeholders, tend to develop stronger relationship with stakeholders. And this makes a lot of sense because when you adopt a generous attitude toward others, you adopt general attitude supposing that you are customer office of a uh, employee. Uh, yeah, uh, and you are treating customer in a generous way, in a thankful way, this customer tend to act alike. They tend to reciprocate, they tend to be more positive, more responsive to your request, to your comments. Instead, when you are uh, self-centered, that is the opposite of generosity, uh, or for example, ungrateful, this means that you are not recognizing others' contribution, uh, stakeholders, customer or any other stakeholder, tend to withdraw, tend not to cooperate, tend to, in some cases, experience negative emotion. And I want to dwell a bit more on this because how some will say, but uh, I don't have any resources. How can I be generous with the stakeholders? Do I have to give them money? Well, there is a lot of research on this too. Generosity that doesn't imply giving tangible things, for example, money, or for example, a manager that is giving a bonus to uh, an employee. This could be one way of being generous, but also you can give other things that we call intangible things, for example, and this is generosity too. So supposing that you are the manager and you want to be more generous to your subordinate, to your employee, you can give them advice. You can give them thanks for their contribution. You can give them technical information. You can give them training. Or you can give them, for example, a access to some contact that could be of value for them. So you see that generosity doesn't, it doesn't mean only giving tangible things. It's also about giving intangible things. And when you're generous, you are oriented toward others. You are not self-centered. In the case of gratitude, is also there is a lot of research on this. Uh, being grateful to others implies valuing them. So you are appreciating, you are recognizing their unique contribution. For example, let's suppose that an employee work many hours over time over to finish with the project, to meet the deadline and you are the manager or you are the colleague, doesn't matter, but you are an employee related to this employee that was working very hard, hardworking employee. And you want to be thankful, well, you have to express this in a very over way, expressing the, mo the motive, the reason of the, the, the gratitude, why you're grateful, for example, thank you for your contribution. And by doing so, and also appreciating their support over this project, because when you do so, you are complying with a very basic need that is that people want to feel appreciated. This is an emotional need that people want to feel appreciated. They want to feel that they count, that they're valuable. In some cases, companies pay very good salaries to employees, but they are not appreciative with them. An employee feel neglected. They feel unacknowledged. An employee, even they have a good salary, they feel dismissed. They, they are prone to look for other places to work where they can feel more valuable. So a question that I leave for this audience is that you can ask yourself a self-reflection question. How can I be more generous with my colleagues and other stakeholders? How can I be more grateful? Because by doing so, you generate a positive cycle of good emotion, more support, reciprocal response from others. Instead, when you are ungenerous or, for example, ungrateful, you generate the opposite. You generate negative emotion, resentment in some cases, or uh, uh, you might see that people treat you in a cold way or they don't cooperate. And this is a very simple but easy to apply tip. Thank you, Bruno. That's brilliant. Um, I'm just having a look here. I think we've got a question from Andrew, please, uh, please. Andrew Wilcock. Um, he said, thanks, Bruno. Have you done any research on non-authentic love and the negative effects that this might have on stakeholders? Non-authentic love. I, I want this person to define what they mean by non-authentic love. Maybe they, 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 my my opinion of non-authentic love is something that looks like love, but is not love. So we call manipulation. There is a and yes, I have a lot of research on this. Uh, what appears to be love, but has a second agenda. This means uh, an, a hidden objective. That this means you are not doing this authentically, spontaneously, honestly, but you do with a specific purpose, 
sim in simple terms, it's called manipulation. There is a full appendix of marketing and manipulation and implies that you are using others as a means to a goal. You are not caring for them. You are caring for your own goals and they are instruments to get your goal achieved, to achieve your goal. So this means that you are using them in an instrumental way. People don't want this. People want to be cared for what they are. So this means that the end shouldn't be uh, your goals, but should be the person itself. When you're applying this principle, you are nurturing relationship. And what happens when you manipulate people? People feel, first of all, they feel deceived, they feel betrayed. And uh, from the customer perspective, more specifically, customers are less likely to come back to this company because they feel that their expectations were not met and might, might be more prone to leave negative reviews because customer, suppose, I give an example. Supposing that you have two products to offer to a customer. Product A, that is very suitable for the customer. And this product cost, from, uh, the price for this product is 100 pounds. Now the second product is less suitable for the customer, but if the price is 200 pounds. You are the seller. If you are caring for customers, you will try to offer uh, the both product, but will try to advise customers to buy the cheapest product because it's the most suitable for them. If you are not loving, you will try to approach this customer, offer this two product and try to offer with more emphasis the product is more expensive. Why? Because you will collect a higher commission. In this case, you don't care for the customer. You care for your commission. This means that you are not serving customer. You are trying to sell the highest price product. And this is not good. Customer if discover this and customer are very intelligent, will probably get deceived once, but then will leave negative reviews and also will obviously push other customers away. So this means that when you are loving, you care for others authentically and there is no second intention. You want them on your side. You, you know that to succeed, your company need the contribution of all these stakeholders. So manipulation is a different way to uh, say that an authentic way of loving people. But also you see, for example, in the environmental aspects, what, what you see, you see, and I give another example, I like this question, hopefully I am uh, answering fully. Uh, you see uh, some company pretend that they're environmentally friendly, but they're not. We, there is a term for this, we call greenwashing. When they pretend they use public relation strategies to show that they're environmentally friendly, for example, that they recycle and they use renewable sources of energy. But in practice, when you research and you investigate this company much more deeply, you see that they're not environmentally friendly, they're polluting the environment. In this case, the company pretended that they were loving, caring with the environment, but in practice, they were acting in the opposite way. The best way to know if a company is authentically loving is, does this business decision benefits all stakeholders involved? Does this end up in a win-win-win situation? Or will there be some stakeholders that are benefited at the expense of others? Well, if they, there is a win-win-win situation, this company is more likely to have an authentic expression of love toward a stakeholder. If there are some trade-offs, this means that some stakeholders are benefited but at the expense of others, well, this company is more likely to be unauthentically. Am I clear? Thank you very much. Very interesting question. I like how they word it. <laughs> Thank you, Bruno. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Andrew. Are there any other questions from, from the audience today? If not, I think we are coming up to about 40, 40 minutes now. So I think that's thank probably you. a good good time to leave it. Um, and I would just like to thank Bruno again uh, for joining us today and, and delivering that very interesting talk. Um, you. you know, we will uh, follow up with attendees if, if there are any further questions after you've had some time to reflect um, on some of the points that Bruno has raised. Um, and obviously you can get in touch with us as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca, for your invite. I, again, thank you for this prestigious institution for having invited me. I feel very honored. And thank you for the attendees to having attended this. Thank you very much. I hope that this was of value. Thank you. Thank you, Bruno. OK, bye bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Take care. Thanks, bye. Rebecca. Bye. Thanks. Bye, Andrew.